Thank you, worship team. Thank you, congregation. It's good to sing praises with you. So glad you're here this morning. So blessed to hear your voices and the worship team. And, and uh, yeah, it's post-Easter. But uh, here you are. Look at you in church. Well done. Good. Glad you came this morning. You'll be blessed. I know I'm blessed when I worship the Lord on a weekly basis. We are in a sermon series called Witnesses. And it's a series from the book of Acts, and it's really fitting because, of course, uh, it picks up the story of the beginning of the church right after uh, the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. Last week, we were uh, blessed by uh, Pastor Chris as he introduced us to chapter 1 and shared um, the fact that uh, we have been called to be witnesses, and we are encouraged because Jesus is not dead or done. He's very much alive, and he has a purpose and a plan, and he is carrying it out, and he's carrying out through the Holy Spirit who empowers us to be witnesses. I don't know about you, but I don't, sometimes I don't feel like a witness. I'm terrified at the thought of being a witness, but we don't do it in our own strength. We do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, We got a whole team uh, when we share our faith, and that's, that's a beautiful thing. And God's plan is unstoppable, absolutely unstoppable. I was reading through the book of Esther uh, earlier this weekend, and so many stories throughout Scripture remind us God's plan is unstoppable. Uh, He has a plan and a purpose, and he invites us to be a part of it. Talk about finding true meaning and purpose in your life uh, that far exceeds uh, just our own small ambitions or whatever, but being a part of the plan of God. We're going to look at chapter 2 this morning. If you don't have a Bible with you, it's page 1078, uh, Pew Bibles in the rack in front of you. Uh, Feel free to grab one of those. We have Wi-Fi too, and maybe you've picked that up already. If you have an electronic device, you can turn your uh, Bibles there. Uh, Chapter 2 this morning. Let's pray uh, before we begin. Father, we thank you so much, as uh, as we were reminded from Scripture last week uh, from Pastor Chris, that... Jesus is not dead, and he is not done. Uh, He is building his church. He is building his kingdom. And we are so grateful for the gift of the Holy Spirit who indwells us, who empowers us to be witnesses for you. And your plan is unstoppable. We thank you that even today you are building your church here and around the world. And uh, we pray that you would teach us from your word. Thank you that your spirit is present. Teach us from your word this morning, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. How many of you have felt the power of electricity before? Let me see your hands. Yeah. Wow, that's something, isn't it? My grandpa, one of my grandpas was a farmer in western Nebraska on my dad's side. And he had a big farm. He had 1,000 acres. Very productive farm. Not only 1,000 acres, but he had 200 head head of cattle as well. And because he had cattle, he had electric fences. And uh, I was born in Germany, so uh, we didn't get to the farm often until uh, by the time I was seven, we moved back to the U.S. And uh, then we were about 200 miles from Grandpa's place. So every once in a while, we'd get in the car and we would drive to Grandpa's. And I can still remember uh, accidentally bumping into an electric fence. I will never forget that day. I mean, it was a shocking experience. (laughs) Um, Some of you maybe are at home do-it-yourself electricians. Maybe that's how you had your little incident. Um, But as strong as that is, it pales in comparison to the power of lightning. Lightning is like a giant electrical shock. I don't know if you ever thought it that way. Um, the power of storms is, is just amazing. Do you know that uh, lightning can travel over five miles? It raises the temperature in the air by as much as 50,000 degrees. When it's traveling through the air, the temperature rises 50,000 degrees. That's five times hotter than the sun. That's how hot it gets. And in a lightning, uh, one lightning strike, there are 100 million electrical volts. A hundred million. If only we could harness that somehow, huh? That would keep that Tesla running a long time. Yeah. Um, 
There are 100,000 storms in the U.S. every year and 25 million strikes of lightning per year. On average, the Earth is struck, if you, if you take a look at the whole planet, uh, every second, 100 lightning bolts. Every second, there's 100 lightning bolts hitting the Earth. It's an amazing amount of power. Well, thank goodness, the odds of becoming a lightning victim in the U.S. are very small. Uh, one in 700,000. So, uh, yeah. I don't know if any of you have stories that way, but, oh, I see a hand going up there. I don't know if that means someone has a story or a family story. Um, people have survived, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's powerful. Well, today we want to talk about a force that is greater than lightning and much more beneficial and available to each one of us. It's the power of the Holy Spirit, and it was unleashed on the day of Pentecost. Let me begin reading in Acts chapter 2, and let's read this amazing account of the day of Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost came, Acts chapter 2, verse 1, they were all together in one place, talking about uh, the believers. So that was the disciples. We know from uh, the upper room and so forth, there were about 120, um, and they were gathered. They were waiting. Jesus had told them to wait, and they were waiting together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. So this is a holiday, a Jewish holiday. So there are people from all over the world that have come. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Okay, a lot of the followers of Jesus was from Galilee, Nazareth of Galilee. A lot of his early followers and disciples were Galileans. They recognized either the appearance. Galilee is kind of hillbilly country, okay? So they recognized these people. And, uh, you know, their accent and so forth. And they're going, aren't these Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? But they're hearing, they're, they're hearing them speak other languages. And here's a list. Parthians. Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, thinking it's very cold there, okay, dumb joke, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Lebanon near, near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts, converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. So basically, he's just going all around uh, the Mediterranean world and, and just listing all these countries, he's doing a circle around the country. So all these people are in Jerusalem for the holidays. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Okay, we'll stop there. Who knew that wine could help you learn another language? Um, <laughs> Yeah, that doesn't make sense at all. But some of them were making fun of them. Well, um, Jesus promised, so let's go 53 days earlier was the Last Supper. Okay? So day of Pentecost, uh, 50. Pentecost means 50. It was a holiday. Uh, it's, it takes place. So Passover is the Exodus. So just to give you a little bit of Israel's history, uh, Passover is celebrating the, it's the historical marker, the exodus from Egypt. When they left Egypt, of course, they, they went out and crossed through the Red Sea. The Egyptian army was destroyed. They worked their way to Mount Sinai. Fifty days later, they're at Mount Sinai, and they're receiving the law. God appears to them, Moses, on Mount Sinai. He gets the Ten Commandments. So these are important historical days in the life of the Old Testament, but now you can see, this is the beauty of the Bible, written by over 1,500 years by 40 different authors, but there's really one author because these themes are running all through Scripture. So Passover has now become Good Friday in the New Testament. The ultimate lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And Pentecost is now about to become the coming of the Holy Spirit. 
There was the giving of the law in the Old Testament. Now there is the giving of the Spirit. And you can see God working, Old Testament, New Testament, how it's all. And I mean, when you, when you study the Bible, I've read through it about 40 or 50 times. It's amazing these themes that run through the Bible. And you begin to realize, no, no, God used different human writers uh, to pen it, but it's the Word of God. It's God describing his plan and his purposes, and it's being unfolded here right before our eyes. So 53 days earlier, Jesus had told his disciples, they probably didn't remember at the time it was, you know, Last Supper, and there was a lot of trauma happening. And, but he had told them in John 14, in that upper room discourse, he had said this, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives, I underline that, he lives with you, with, but, future tense, will be where? What does it say? Help me. In you. Wow, God is going to do something radically different. The Holy Spirit is with you, but not too long from now, when I send him, he's going to be in you. He's going to be in you. A little farther that evening, uh, but very, very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. And then last week in Pastor Chris's sermon, we were looking at Acts chapter 1, and it says this, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them his command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water talking about John the Baptist, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But you will receive power, he goes on to say in verse 8, when the Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You find it hard to wait? I find it hard to wait. They were told to wait. How long did they wait? Well, you can do the simple math. They waited 10 days, okay? Because the ascension was 40 days after the resurrection. They went back to the upper room 10 days because it's Pentecost, 50 days. 50 50 minus 40, 10 days. They were in the upper room, 120 of them. What were they doing? Praying, maybe fasting. They were waiting. God, Jesus had told them, wait. Wait for the coming of the Spirit. So that's where they are in the upper room, and we just read what happened there. Um, Three evidences of his arrival. Uh, God does it rather dramatically. It doesn't usually happen that way, uh, but he does it rather dramatically because this is a a significant milestone in history, and signs are sometimes helpful. Sometimes I need signs. I'm a guy. I need signs. I get lost sometimes. Give me some strong signs. Thank you very much. God gives three very powerful signs. There is a sound like a blowing of wind. It doesn't mean there was actually a huge wind, but there was a sound of a blowing wind. Of, of, of rushing wind. And it's interesting, the word spirit in Greek is pneuma, and that word can mean wind. It means wind or spirit, depending on the context. It's one of those words that has multiple meanings, pneuma. And they hear the sound of wind. In fact, Jesus, way back earlier, uh, when he was talking to Nicodemus uh, earlier in his ministry, says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. He, he's creating a parallel, he says, and the Spirit is like a powerful wind in some sense because you don't see him, but you can see in his effect. I was looking at my app this morning. I was trying to see, should I wear the sweater or not? Oh, it's kind of chilly still. Maybe I'll put the sweater on. Uh, but then I was looking, and when you go to the weather app, they're always, it's clickbait. It's all over the place. They're showing me this tree that's falling apart because of the wind. The wind is blowing. Somewhere in the world, they found this video someone's home video camera, and they put it up there because they want clickbait. They want you to go to it. And I'm watching this tree disintegrate because of the wind. You can't see the wind, but that's the power of the wind. So it's a perfect analogy because we can't see the Spirit. He's invisible to us, but He's very real and He's very powerful. Wind is incredibly powerful. Imagine you in a car having a tug-of-war. Who wins? Well, probably the car. It's stronger, isn't it? Yeah. 
You ever seen what happens to a car when it hits a big tree? The tree's got a little scratch in it, maybe. The car's demolished. But the wind can take that tree and blow it right over. It's the power of the wind. So we see the wind. The first thing, that hear the sound of the wind. The next thing is there were tongues of fire. So not only do we see the presence of God through this sound of wind, but we, we also uh, are reminded of his holiness. And this is a common, another sign or symbol of the presence of God throughout the Bible. Moses and the, what was it? The burning bush, right? The fire, the holiness of God. Israel and the pillar of fire. What led him through the wilderness? The pillar of fire at night. Um, Mount Sinai, the fire on Mount Sinai. John answered them, this is John the Baptist speaking, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He's talking about Jesus. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. With fire. So clear signs to help these early believers understand what's happening, what's going on here. Oh, this is the Holy Spirit, the wind, the pneuma, and the fire, and so forth. And then it says they began to speak in other tongues. We're not going to get into a whole theology of tongue speaking this morning. We don't have time for that, but I'm just going to unpack this little section here. The word tongues here is dialecto, dialecto. What does that sound? Dialects? Dialects? And it's clear in this passage that what they spoke were not unknown languages. They spoke specific languages. Because people that day from all over the world were hearing Greece and Greek and Latin and Italian. Well, maybe the Italian was Italian invented then. I don't know yet. But they were hearing languages. They were hearing languages being spoken in their own language. They the Spirit was enabling them to preach the gospel in languages so everybody could hear and understand. This is amazing. There, there's so much I could go on here, but there isn't time. This is a huge shift in, 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 the, in the history of mankind. What happened at the Tower of Babel? We were forever divided because of languages. The gospel comes and it's beginning to unite. When we come together in Jesus Christ, it unites us because the now we can all speak the same language. We are talking to each other. This is the power of God. This is what we're looking for someday in heaven when there. Yes, I was disturbed last night when I saw that there could be more stuff in the Middle East. But God has a plan and a purpose, and he is going to bring peace one day. He's uniting. He's the one who unites. He takes the curse of Babel, and now he's turning. He's turning it. He's changing it. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. So this is very important. I will do a little bit of theology this morning. When did you receive the Holy Spirit? You go, Pastor Sam, I don't ever remember wind, a rushing wind. I don't remember something looking like little flames of fire on my head. And I did try to take some Spanish or French in high school, wasn't so good at it. <laughs> yeah. So this is something very unique. We shouldn't expect this to happen over and over in every situation. But the Bible does tell us when we receive the Holy Spirit. It's very clear about that. First of all, you can't be saved without the work of the Holy Spirit. So in other words, what this implies is if you are a believer in Jesus Christ today, you have received the Holy Spirit. Listen to what Jesus told Nicodemus. Very Truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. You have to have a physical birth and a spiritual birth. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. In other words, you can't be spiritually alive this morning unless the Spirit of God is in you. It's the spirit that makes someone spiritual. It makes them alive. Then let's go to another verse. So when was the baptism of the Holy Spirit? When did that occur for me? Well, 
Paul talks about that in Romans 6 when he's talking about the baptism of the Spirit. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we may live a new life. So this is not talking about water baptism. This is talking about spirit baptism. And, and what Paul is saying here, we don't have time to do the larger context. He's saying the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, it was like you were baptized with the Holy Spirit. And it was like you were with Christ on the cross. And you were buried with him. You died to your old self. And then the Spirit raised you to your new self. And you were raised with Christ. The baptism of the Spirit happened the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And like the Spirit, it was something you couldn't see, but it's something that happened inside of you, and it was powerful, and it's transforming. In fact, that's why your life is different than it used to be. This is the power of God in you. This isn't you summoning up, oh, look at I'm becoming a better person every day. No, this is the power of God in you. This is the power of God. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit places in the body of Christ. This was what makes us brothers and sisters this morning. And this is not just an earthly relationship. We have earthly brothers and sisters. But when you become my spiritual brother and sister through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that is an eternal relationship. We will always be brothers and sisters in Christ for all eternity. Listen what... It says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For we were all baptized by one Spirit so as to form one body, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, and we were all given one Spirit to drink. So if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have received the Holy Spirit. In fact, Romans 8, 9 says, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, then if anyone, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. In other words, you can't be a believer without the Spirit, Paul is saying. You, you, you can only be a believer with the Spirit. They, they go hand in hand. Okay? Now, there is something that is repeated and ongoing, and that's the filling of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.16. I don't know if Paul was channeling Day of Pentecost because he brings up the wine. He says, do not be drunk on wine. <laughs> um, Paul's writing this like, I don't know, 30 years after Pentecost or whatever. But he says, do not be drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. So that is a command. That is something we seek. The baptism of the Spirit, we don't seek. You receive that. The Holy Spirit came to live inside you the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ. But the filling of the Spirit, that is an ongoing thing that we seek. And the filling of the Spirit is not receiving the Holy Spirit. We've received Him. It's not so much us getting more of Him, it's Him getting more of us. Because sometimes when we become a believer in Christ, we have doors in our room that we don't want God to go into. No, that's, that's not for you. Okay, you can have my Sunday door, but not my work door, Monday to Friday. Or you can, okay, maybe I'll let you come, go with me to work, Jesus. Maybe I will, but not when I want to go entertain myself. I just want you to leave then. And, and so there is a process where we, has to, we have to surrender our life daily to the Spirit and say, here I am, I'm completely yours. Just like when you take a sip of alcohol, the alcohol begins to control you, so the filling of the Spirit. And we're saying, no, I I, I don't want to be controlled by alcohol or whatever else I might think controls my life. I want to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Fill me, Spirit. I want to be under your control today. Okay, we got to move on. That was a lot. I covered quite a bit there, but we'll pick up the pace a little. Um... Why, why the delay here? Were, were, the, were, the, were those 120 people saved? Yes, were people in the Old Testament saved? Yes, before the giving of the Holy Spirit. He was with them, but he wasn't in them yet. But now what is being fulfilled in the upper room is happening, the day of Pentecost. God is doing something new. In fact, it was promised way back in Jeremiah under the New Covenant. 
So now we have the Holy Spirit living inside us. This is an amazing thing. Listen to me, people. God, the Holy Spirit, lives inside you. You want to talk about a life coach. Do you know that God, the Holy Spirit, lives inside you? Wow. Wow. That should, that should do all kinds of things when we, when we meditate and think about that. It certainly should make us want to live our lives in glory and, and in honor to him, in holiness and purity. But it, it means there's unbelievable potential that God can do through you. Example number one, stumbling, uneducated, Hillbilly Peter is about to preach a sermon. He has had no theological education. He's a Galilean. He's a fisherman. He is about to preach on the day of Pentecost. Listen to what he preaches. Because the Spirit of God is in him now and is enabling him to do things that he could never do on his own. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. The bars aren't open. What are you saying? Come on. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. God enables... I don't know if, if Peter had memorized a lot of Scripture or not, but God brought Scripture to mind. The Holy Spirit is in him, and he's, he's speaking through Peter now. In the last days, he quotes from Joel chapter 3, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven Heavens above and signs and earth below, blood, fire, billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay, great quote from Joel. We we don't have time to go there and explore it. But Joel is condensing. And he said, someday Jesus is coming back and there's going to be all this stuff happening during that period. And, and Peter quotes from that and said, that, this is what you're starting to see. This is, this is fulfillment of prophecy right before your eyes. And here's the, the punchline. Here's the good news. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Call on the name of the Lord. Come on, people. Call on the name of the Lord. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Now he's going to talk to them about Jesus. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. He was here for three years. You saw the miracles he did. You knew that that this was something special. You knew that Jesus was something unique and special. You saw it through the miracles. But listen to what happened. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Peter's pretty blunt there. I love the way he put, combines both their human responsibility, you who put him to death, but it was God's plan. It was God's plan all along. But God raised him, verse 24, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, now he's going to quote more scripture from Psalm 16, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will not fill me. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried in his tomb and his tomb is here to this day. So what he's saying is when David was writing that psalm, he wasn't writing about himself. He's dead. His tomb's right there. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an oath and that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah. This is Jesus speaking through David, talking about how God the Father was not going to let his body decay. 
that he was not abandoned to the realm death, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Great, great uh, message. We're probably just getting the condensed version. might have been longer. But uh, let me just give you three tips here uh, on witnessing that Paul tells us, that uh, Peter helps us with. Number one, point people to Jesus. It's all about Jesus, people. We have to point people to Jesus. He is the Messiah. That is the heart of this message. You, people have to come to understand who Jesus is and what he has done for them. We talk about Jesus. Number two, use the Bible. Peter's Bible was the Old Testament. The New Testament is just being written. But he's using the Bible. Use the Bible. Number three, rely on the Holy Spirit. Rely on the Holy Spirit. Um, down through the years, uh, I, I don't feel like I have the gift of evangelism. Uh, but down through the years, I've tried to uh, give the Holy Spirit tools, you know. Okay, I'm going to learn the Romans Road. How many of you are familiar with the Romans Road? Okay. So it's, what it is is just a series of, of four or five verses you can memorize from the book of Romans. And over a coffee with a friend, you can just walk them through the gospel. You can just tell them, this is what the Bible teaches, how you can reconnect with God. It's not complicated. Number one, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. I don't know if you can read it. It's kind of small, but I got it up there. Um, yeah, Romans 3.23. You can write down the references. You can look them easy, uh, later. These are verses you can mark in your Bible or you can memorize them. They're not that hard. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory. All have sinned. I don't care how good you think you are. You know deep down that you're a sinner too. You've done things and said things you should never say. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. Sin leads to death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So how do we get out of this mess? Well, it's through Jesus. Romans 5, 8 goes on to say, verse number 4, but God demonstrates his own love for this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So how do I receive this salvation? Romans 10, 9, and 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. There's the gospel. Peter was preaching the gospel. We can preach the gospel too. He was uneducated. He had no theological education. You don't need theological education. Rely on the Holy Spirit. Uh, one of the internships I did when in school was with Campus uh, Crusade for Christ at the University of Texas Arlington. We were working with sports teams, uh, with a baseball team and the football team. We would do evangelistic meetings with them and then invite them to Bible studies, the athletes, and we'd have Bible studies with them and so forth. And I love one of the statements that uh, come, came way back from the beginning of Campus Crusade. Uh, Bill Bright was the founder. He's, he's uh, passed on now. But he has this great uh, statement, uh, which takes some of the pressure out of witnessing. It takes, no, no, it takes all the pressure out of witnessing. It goes like this. Success in witnessing is sharing Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God. Isn't that good? I can't save anybody. I'm not the Spirit of God. I, I can't bring spiritual life to anybody. But the Spirit can. And I just want to be available. God the Spirit, if you want to use me, I will, I will speak scripture to people. I will talk to my friends and my family and people, and I will share the, God, the good news with them. But it's you got to do it. I, I, I'm no great. I, I'm not a... No, it's the Spirit of God. I just share, and then I leave it with God. God, you'll have to do the work in their heart. You'll have to convince them that this is true. 
You'll have to give them new life. So let me promote the witnessing workshop. Uh, I got the thing up here. Saturday, get some tools, people. Okay? We're bringing it as easy as we can to you. Put the couple up here. Oh, aren't they fantastic looking? Yeah. So there, uh, just a year ago, we brought on Brandon and Lydia Brooks uh, to partner with them. They do. You want to talk tough evangelism? He works at NYU, sharing his faith. She works at the Fashion Institute. Okay? Yeah, they're doing it with college kids, sharing their faith, bringing people to Jesus. So uh, they do this full time. This is their ministry. And I said, wouldn't it be great if you guys could come and just tell us, how do you, do, how do you even talk to people about God nowadays? People are often hard and skeptical and whatever. Can you share a little bit of some of the stuff you're doing and, and maybe give us some tips on how we can better talk to people about our faith? So they said, yeah, we'll come. We'll come. They're coming Saturday, 9 to 12. Even if you can only come for an hour or two, come and, and hear what they have to say. Uh, there's no fee. There's going to be a breakfast. The Missions Commission's putting on a breakfast. We're going to have little baskets out there so you can pitch in some money to help pay for the breakfast. And, but we need to know. Uh, sign up. Sign up and come. Come for even an hour or two and see what they can teach you. I, uh, throughout my life, I have always taken advantage of situations like this because I always want as many tools. I, I am not a... I'm looking at Chet here because he's a handyman. I've seen his van full of tools and stuff. And, and if you're a handyman and stuff, you're collecting tools and stuff, the more tools you have. And especially like when you go on the top of a roof, you want to make sure you got a full belt of tools because you don't want to have to go up and down the ladder five times. It's, oh, I forgot this. Oh, I got to go get this. Oh, I got to... No, no, you get the tools. And witnessing, it's good to get tools. Yeah. We rely on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit testifies about Jesus. That's what he's come to do. He's come to talk about Jesus. That's what he does. He wants to talk about Jesus through us. In fact, that's what Jesus said before he came in John 14, 26. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Chapter 15, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. Oh, good, the verse is up there. You can see it. So he's going to testify about Jesus. That's what the Spirit has come to do. And what? Who else is supposed to? You also. And you also must testify. Okay? Okay. He's talking to the disciples there, but he, he's talking to us today, too. You also must testify. But we're not alone. we got the Holy Spirit with us. You're never alone when you're talking about Jesus. You're not alone. Okay, we got to keep moving here. Um, look what happens at the end of the story. Look what happens. Yeah. The people's response. And when the people heard this, picking up with verse 37... They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? They could have gotten really mad at Peter. He kind of poked his finger at them and said, You put Jesus to death. But it says they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers and sisters, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent. Repent. Repent is a word. It means to, to change, to turn. You, you were walking this way in life, now you need to go this way. You were walking in sins, now you need to turn to God. You were rejecting Jesus, you, wanted to, you were yelling, crucify him. Now you've got to go and worship him. You've got to turn, go the other direction and realize that he is the Son of God. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of, of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit too. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ... They will receive the Holy Spirit too. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted the message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Wow. 
I'm not an evangelist, but through God's grace, I've seen a fair number of people come to Christ. I can remember in college, uh, one of the professors, we'd go out to the airports and we did the cold turkey evangelism right at the airports. Um, and, and then I remember one time I was on a tour group and, and the bus driver, I had a chance to share faith with him and he came to faith in Christ. It is, uh, oh, it, there's nothing I'd exchange for it. You're very humbled because it's not you. It's not you winning to the Lord. It's the Holy Spirit working through you. And God wants to do that in, through you too. He wants to do that. Cut to the heart. Was that Peter's brilliant speaking ability? No, no. See, the Spirit not only helps you to speak, certainly the Holy Spirit helped him to speak, but he's, he's doubling up because he's not only helping you to speak, but at the same time, he's working on their conscience and convicting them. Wow, they don't stand a chance. It's fantastic. Look what Jesus said in the, back in the upper room discourse. But the, very truly I tell you, it is good for you that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Holy Spirit, the advocate, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world or literally convict the world, uh, prove the world to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because people do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. So it's the Holy Spirit who is working as you're sharing. He is working in their hearts and minds, just as he did at the day of Pentecost. Have you ever felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your own life? Yeah, my hand goes up. <laughs> I felt it, obviously, when I became a believer. I felt the need to, to repent and come to Christ. And I felt it as a believer when he's convicting me about some, some things maybe I'm not doing right in my life. I felt it. Have you turned in repentance and faith to Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins? If you're here this morning, I encourage you today, become a believer in Jesus. 3,000 added that day. The Holy Spirit is essential for God's work. He's referred to over 50 times in Acts. The Spirit mentioned 45 times, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit 64 times. He empowers to communicate, to preach, to convict, to regenerate. I like what Chuck Swinstall said, the Holy Spirit transformed their lives. Their human frailties, think about those, their fragile situation uh, in the upper room, 120 of them. Their human frailties were transformed into supernatural gifts and abilities. Their fearful reluctance was transformed into bold confidence. Their fears and intimidation were transformed into a sense of invincibility. Their lonely, grim feelings of abandonment were transformed into joyful perseverance. That's what the Spirit can do. He wants to do it in our hearts and lives, too. God has a plan to reach the world. He does. And you know what? He wants to do it through you. He says, come on, let's do it together. I'll give you my spirit. He wants to be at work in you and through you. Father, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to invite the deacons forward. Come on up, deacons. We're going to have uh, communion. Father, we, we're so grateful um, for this amazing event in history which uh, certainly changed the course of human history. Uh, that day was pretty amazing. I mean, 120 to 3,000 was pretty amazing, but within 300 years, Christianity is, is the religion of Rome. I mean, it's, it's amazing what happened over that period of time. The impact of Christianity is undeniable in our world today. And, Father, we want to be, continue to be a part of that. Uh, we... We, in fact, we tell you this morning, here we are, we're, we, we're your servants, and we, we want to be uh, fully available under the control of the Spirit, uh, even like Peter, uh, just sharing our faith, using Scripture, telling others about Jesus, and then leaving the results to you, asking your Spirit to work in those people's hearts so that they would believe too. Thank you for this most amazing plan. Thank you that you are calling people to yourself today. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.